This is what PlayStation Studios do best. Complete cohesive experiences unlike anything else that you can get on other platforms. God of War Ragnarok takes this ethos and runs with it, delivering a mind-blowing experience for old and new fans alike. Welcome everybody, my name is Doricon and this is my review of God of War Ragnarok. Technical stuff. I want to tackle the technical stuff first, because as impressive as it is, it is tertiary to everything else in this package. In years to come, we won't be talking about the 4K visuals, the haptic feedback or the 120 frames per second. The lack of bugs and glitches won't be in the conversation. The audio design and execution will be an afterthought, because these aren't what makes a game. It's the sum of all these parts married with the story and gameplay that leave a lasting impression. When talking about God of War 2018 now, no one talks about 60 frames per second on PS4 Pro. No one talks about the rumble, the lack of bugs or the graphical fidelity. They talk instead about the combat and encounter design. They talk about the story beats, cutscenes, quotes and clutch moments. The technical stuff is forgotten in conversation. That being said though, the experience would not be what it is without the technical stuff. Now there are games where we talk about resistive triggers, haptic feedback, 3D audio and so on. But the best games utilise all of these factors and make them invisible. That's what Returnal did in 2021. Even now, I'd still say that game uses the next-gen hardware far more and far better than any other release. When you're playing it, you don't notice the implementation of these hardware features though. Thankfully, God of War Ragnarok does a very similar thing. The game is so good and so immersive that you don't notice the subtle haptic feedback informing you where an attack is coming from. You don't notice yourself relying on the audio to inform you of your surroundings and avoid plant traps or prepare for combat. You don't even notice that resistive triggers are only in certain moments in this first party game. And honestly, I think all of this is great. Trust me, you would notice if these things disappeared or weren't included, but the fact that they are invisible unless you are specifically looking for them is a huge compliment to Sony Santa Monica's design, build and skill. And the same is true for graphics and the user interface. Ragnarok is a stunningly beautiful game, regardless of whether you're playing it on the PS4 or PS5. Even with that cross-generation development, it is possibly the best we've yet seen on this gen in terms of photorealism but you don't notice it while playing. Unlike God of War 3, where some characters and assets looked much worse than the main characters, Ragnarok pays specific attention to every single detail. Because everything is of such high quality, it once again becomes invisible. It's just part of the world, and that is wonderful. Menus aren't clustered or confusing. The stats screen has a specific button that explains everything that is outlined upon it. Armor has much more flavor text than 2018, and each piece's bonuses are much easier to see, find, and understand. Skills are better explained, more varied, interesting, and upgradable, with a Destiny-style cursor for navigation. There is a lot more information and display items in this game's menus and user interface than its predecessor, but it doesn't feel like it, which is impressive. One side of the technical stuff that does deserve to be part of the conversation for years to come, though, is the accessibility settings. Now I'm an able gamer. I don't need to utilize these settings to be able to play. So to understand the impact of these settings for disabled gamers, I would suggest looking up reviews from the likes of Able Gamers, Steve Saylor and their counterparts. For fully able gamers such as myself though, these features are not to be overlooked. AutoCollect, for example, has saved my DualSense controller there is a lot of loot to collect in the game, and it all requires a press of the circle button per item. Paired with mashing circle in combat encounters to break out of enemies' holds, having the game auto-collect resources outside of battle, and health and rage crystals in battle, not only keeps the gameplay flow better, but as stated, saves additional wear on your controller. I still have to interact with treasures, boxes, collections and such, but this setting streamlines the game experience and heightens my personal experience. It doesn't stop there for me though. Subtitle, size, colour, blurring and background have micro-adjustments to tailor them to the best way that suits you. 
I have a coloured name for who is speaking and no blurring or background personally. It's clear, looks great and doesn't interfere with the beauty of the world or cutscene. For me, a big one was being able to turn off lock-on. I hate lock-on mechanics in melee combat games and adored Ghost of Tsushima for omitting that awful mechanic in 2020. God of War goes a different route though and allows you to choose if you want it or not. I chose to turn it off and my game experience has been far better for that due to no accidental lock-ons of the wrong target. There are settings for the visually impaired like high contrast mode and audio cue mode. There are settings for the physically impaired such as press and hold rather than mash, auto traversal, fine tuning, highlighted paths and so on. You can choose an immersive mode to have a Ghost of Tsushima like experience with zero HUD until you swipe the touchpad. You can remap every button and input. The list is extensive and regardless of your personal ability, allows you to tailor the game to your personal tastes, i.e. farewell film grain and motion blur. It is a stunning array of options that really should get much more applause than it has been receiving, and while designed and built to allow disabled gamers to play Ragnarok, they are all settings that can change and enhance every single player's experience. So what about negatives from a technical standpoint? The version of the game that you play may have a big impact on this. My full playthrough was on PlayStation 5, where I noticed three bugs throughout the whole game. And I do use the term bug sparingly, as all three were moments where I had asked the game and system to do more than it could handle. It's similar to asking Excel to perform formulas across three full sheets of data, and the computer just goes, nope. So those three moments where I overwhelmed things were an audio line that kept repeating periodically, a quick reset of the checkpoint later and this never happened again, I had one boss get stuck to me like glue, I'd been in a runic strike, tried to enter rage and hit a cutscene simultaneously. Again though, a checkpoint reset and good to go. And finally, an attack prompt got stuck on the screen when I took out six enemies at once. Again, checkpoint reset and away it went. That was it, through the whole game. I noticed no screen tears or frame drops, incredibly short load times whether from a closed application or a restart after death. It was, bar those three very minor moments, a flawless experience. PS4, on the other hand, left more to be desired. In terms of screen tears, frames, bugs and what have you, PS4 Pro was actually a cleaner playthrough. But the load times were painful, and the install size was actually bigger than on PlayStation 5. Now on load times, I understand that a mechanical hard drive will be slower than a solid state drive. But I sat on a blank screen for nearly a minute on first startup before I got to the PlayStation Studios stinger. On subsequent startups, it was between 30 seconds and a minute to load the main menu, and then that again to load the game. Compared to Ghost of Tsushima from two years earlier on the same PlayStation 4 console, the load times were exponentially longer. In terms of file size, I don't know how compression and the differences in hardware make a difference to the size of the game. But on PlayStation 4, Ragnarok is 109GB in size compared to the 91GB on PlayStation 5. That's nearly an entire game's worth of additional space required for the last gen version to be installed. Most PS4s only have a 500GB hard drive as standard, so you're taking up one fifth of that space with a single game. Add in one live service game like Destiny and an annual Call of Duty or similar, along with the space required for the system to run, and that gamer's hard drive is completely full with only three games. If the previous generation is to be supported for longer moving forward, file size compression seriously needs to be looked into and worked upon by all development studios. That all being said though, I still got 60 frames per second on the last gen device. I still got dynamic 4K. I had zero bugs or glitches, and once you're in the game, as long as you don't die, load times don't matter anyway. All up. It means that while I've nitpicked the file size and load times, that's only because they're about the only negative things I can say at all about the game's technical ability. Gameplay and Design The God of War series, with all previous sequels, has followed the same ethos. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. 2018 is classified as an exceptional game and a soft reboot, so therefore didn't follow this formula. Ragnarok, set a mere three years after 2018, is a direct sequel to that game. 
So does the old ethos hold true? Partially. And if you played the 2018 game, the first few hours will feel very much like a been there, done that type scenario. Now this isn't a negative or a slight against the game here. That feeling of familiarity fits the framing of the story and world, so it works really well and helps to reacclimatize you to the way that God of War operates. 2018 was also an exceptionally good handling title. In the four years since its release, it has remained feeling current in its moment-to-moment -moment gameplay, so lifting and shifting that gameplay to the sequel is a great idea. But then, as you start to use it and advance this new game, it evolves. Subtly, but greatly. Now I completed the story at around the 30 hour mark. I'm currently at just over 51 hours played while writing this script, and I still want to play the game for the satisfaction of the gameplay alone. Combat is incredible, for example. While there are frustrations like animation locks and such, it is very clearly defined when these animation locks take place. Example, light and heavy runic attacks with your weapons. These are all animation locked. If I don't want to get locked into an animation because of the foe I'm fighting, I simply don't use the runic attacks. This might mean that the combat encounter is longer at this point, but it is a tactical choice that I have made to combat the situation in front of me. You don't notice the time passing though, because it is your choice that has created it, and the base combat is so varied and so good thanks to the skill tree. Now narratively, Fimble Winter's effect has destroyed the magical upgrades of both your Leviathan Axe and Blades of Chaos earned in the last game, bringing them back to a level 1 scenario. As you unlock the skill tree, you re-earn many of the previously used upgrades, but there are also new ones to encounter, some of which were runic attacks in the last game but are inclusive to this game's skill tree, giving you more combat tools at your disposal. The Axe's Ice Floor attack, for example, is unlocked as a hold of the R1 button in combat, rather than a light runic attack as seen in 2018, and so on. The tree feels more varied and in-depth, opening up different options in combat that feel more accessible than in the last game, but they feel like they offer a higher skill ceiling, and it means you can pull off some fantastic clutch moments or ultimate wins without taking a hit much more naturally. Coupled with knowing exactly which animations are locked and which aren't, it gives a vast array of tools and knowledge in combat encounters very rarely repeated in other categories. But Ragnarok's combat goes further. Each skill that you unlock from the tree then has a mastery to it. If you successfully use that skill a certain amount of times, it will allow it to be upgraded further. This can add more base damage to the move, more elemental buildup, more damage resistance to yourself while using the move, or more stun to be applied to the target. Now it isn't the most in-depth system, offering three confined options to each level of mastery. However, I noticed it had a big impact on my gameplay, especially in boss battles on Give Me No Mercy mode. Filling a boss's stun gauge gives you a big chunk of damage to the boss. It also gives you a big stun locked opening to do even more damage, and depending on the armor and weapon hilts you're using, additional buffs such as a burst of health or rage, maybe even both or more. This meant I used my mastery to build into stun on one weapon and damage on the other to offer a balanced but powerful approach to combat. Given I planned to stun a lot as well, I also built my armor set around lots of stuns, giving me those bursts of health and rage to keep the cycle going. Now runic attacks built into this too. Some offer huge elemental build up to burn a target and so on. Some do outright damage or outright stun, and some are very balanced. The cooldowns of all this build into how you approach combat. Are your runic attacks constant utility with a quick refresh, or are they for big bursts of damage when there is an opening? The combat is heavy, powerful, fluid, and most importantly, tactical. You can't charge into a situation and button mash. You have to be precise, know your build and utilize it to succeed. And the game gives you plenty of opportunity to tweak, practice and adjust appropriately. The combat is so good that I can easily see myself taking another run at the game on Give Me God of War mode after I've earned the Platinum Trophy, just so I can have further combat challenges in this excellent gameplay. But of course, a game is more than just combat, and world traversal is vastly improved in this game. It's faster for the most part, utilizing Kratos' weapons and strength to zip up and down as you couldn't in 2018. Once a climbing or platforming puzzle has been completed, you can also unlock shortcuts to make returning to an area a swifter and more rewarding experience. The only thing that hasn't really improved from the last game 
is the handling of the boat. But, as someone who kayaked and canoed for a living when I first entered the workplace, that's how these types of vessels handle. There's nothing to improve, because it's already quite realistic. There are dog sleds available to use in certain realms, a grapple hook system, a swing bar system, a wall break mechanic, death from above jumps, zip lines, and fast travel that fits both the narrative and what came in the last instalment, just loading exponentially quicker on the PlayStation 5. I never got frustrated moving around the game world. I never became bored of the traversal, because it's been designed in a balanced manner that will move you onto a different form of traversal before the one that you are currently engaging with becomes stale. Add in character conversations that progress characterization or narrative while undertaking traversal, and you find you look forward to these platforming moments to engage further with the game, characters, and world. And that world, or should I say worlds as you do visit the Nine Realms, is beautiful. It doesn't matter which realm you are in, there is beauty to behold at some point. For me, Midgard's change from 2018 is a fantastic beauty. You're encountering an area that you know, that same Lake of the Nine, that same Temple of Tyr, the same realm towers, but all in a changed state. It's fantastic. The Dwarven realm of Svartalheim being a watery beauty, Vanaheim being lush and green, the magma fields of Moosfulheim and the icy barrenness of Helheim, they're all beautifully created, superbly brought together and incredibly well thought out. It's rare for me in more recent gaming trends to have moments of, wow, look at this world. But I had that multiple times through Ragnarok, and that's special for me. The whole game is fantastic. But there was one design factor that really annoyed me throughout the entire game. It's an obvious design choice. It is a conscious choice and solution created by Sony Santa Monica Studios. That choice is your companion characters not allowing you to figure out a puzzle. Now I don't know how much of the world gets a UK TV show called Taskmaster, but there is a moment in it where the comedian James Acaster tells the host Greg Davies to get on with opening a puzzle box the moment it has landed in his hands. Greg has had no opportunity to properly look at the puzzle box, let alone start to figure out the puzzle and open it, and James is yelling at him to get on with it. I bring this moment from Taskmaster up because it feels like my companions are James Acaster in every single puzzle. No matter where in the worlds, no matter how long I may need, the companion characters seem to think that I am completely incapable of completing a puzzle task myself, and they sound exasperated with every line of dialogue when I haven't figured it out in 0.7 of a second flat. To compound this matter though, unlike almost literally everything else in the game, there are no accessibility settings to turn this annoyance off, to increase the time it takes before the characters start prompting you. Nothing. I can change almost every other factor of gameplay and puzzles, but not the companions ruining the discovery of each puzzle. I hope this is adjusted in a future patch, maybe alongside a New Game Plus and Photo Mode update. But as it stands right now, this one thing, because it is so prolific throughout the game, does somewhat tarnish an otherwise excellent gameplay and design experience. Does it diminish the game overall for me? No. I still think Ragnarok is a masterpiece of design and gameplay. It is tightly honed and incredibly focused, which has elevated it above the competition. It offers levels of accessibility which are industry leading, and I sadly missed when jumping over to the Switch to play the new Pokemon. But it is noticeable, and it is annoying, and it's something that players coming into the game should be aware of ahead of time. Overall though, a superb gameplay and design experience. Narrative. There are certain superlatives that I try not to use in reviews, because they often set an unrealistic expectation that the game cannot live up to, regardless of how good it is. With Ragnarok's narrative, however, I feel comfortable saying, it's incredible. This is an ending to the Norse saga in a similar vein to God of War 3 being the ending of the Greek saga, and the satisfaction is easily as good. But I would say that the execution is better. 
Now, knowing the general tale of Ragnarok from the Edda's and Neil Gaiman's Norse mythology dramatization of it, the tale told, with the setup we've had, is, in my opinion, one of the best renditions of Ragnarok yet. Much of this comes from the characterization for me. Each character is given time to grow, flourish, and evolve. From our two protagonists of Kratos and Atreus, to side characters such as Radatoska, the Idrisil squirrel, and our antagonists, Odin, Thor, Heimdall, the Aesir in general. Every character feels real, no matter how big or small their part. And for Kratos, it is a super satisfying look at his entire history to draw from and help avert the prophecy of Ragnarok, as seen at the end of the last game, where he lies dead in Atreus' arms. This destroyer of worlds, this god slayer, has to toil throughout much of the narrative between who he was, who he is, and who he wants to be, along with who people want him to be. Atreus is the same. Learning he is half Olympian and half Jotnar, meant to be called Loki, has made him as inquisitive about himself as he is about Ragnarok. And he has a different yet parallel journey of discovery to Kratos about who he was, is, is expected and wants to be. But as Brock puts it so eloquently just before the third act, it is the nature of a thing that matters, not its form. And throughout Ragnarok's narrative, we learn of its nature and, along with our characters, we learn of Kratos' and Atreus' true natures. But the same is true for the supporting cast. From Amir admitting his crimes and requesting assistance in trying to put things right, to Sindri confiding huge secrets in Atreus. From Freya going on the attack for retribution, to Thor's loving familial relationships. Every character is completely fleshed out. This means when they then interact with one another, their interactions feel real, feel organic, and despite being scripted pieces, don't feel like they are. This is a huge achievement from the writing and direction teams, and they really should be applauded for such exceptional execution. The narrative itself is a God of War twist on the tale we have known about for over a thousand years. It puts Kratos and Atreus slash Loki central in many of the big moments, which means some of the established mythology has to shift around. But it is done so in an honourable manner. By that, I mean the big beats remain fairly similar. Jormungandr arrives and battles Thor, for example, just as in the Eddas. Fenrir is present, Freya dies to the flaming sword of Sutter, Asgard is shattered, and so on. These are all moments that happen in any rendition of Ragnarok, even in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. However, the supporting cast, locations, origins, or even conclusions of these moments, considering a Greek god of war never entered the Norse myths in the original texts, may be different. That being said, they are all still within the character of the original tale that we know from the Eddas. This offers a unique feeling as a player. Through society, most players are going to know the general tale of Ragnarok, so you have an idea of how this will play out before starting. Through God of War 2018, we have a prophecy that says how this will play out for our protagonists, aka death. Heading into this game, you think you understand the journey. You think you know when and how the story beats will happen and how it will all end. A perfect parallel to the characters you are playing as. But in a stroke of genius from the writing room, Sony Santa Monica subvert most of those moments and leave you shocked, amazed, dumbfounded and impressed on many different occasions. This is a tale that should be experienced personally, whether you watch a playthrough of it or play it yourself. The narrative will have the same impact regardless. I'm not going to spoil the story for you, but I do want to give an example. So I've chosen one from the early game that we've seen in trailers and at the end of the last game. Thor's arrival at the house. We all knew what to expect. With the unveiling of Mjolnir from under Thor's cloak, a battle for the centuries would ensue between two destructive, ultra-powerful gods. Instead, Thor pulls out a bottle of mead, and they sit down at the table to talk, with the Allfather joining them in an attempt to prevent further killing and broker peace. Now that's not a huge subversion of expectation, and as seen in trailers, you eventually do end up fighting Thor. But I never expected to sit down for a conversation with him. Even in 2018, we just killed the gods. We didn't talk with them. Or when we tried, like with Baldur, 
They were so stubborn and bullheaded that a fight was inevitable. Narratively, this game never feels like the fights are inevitable. You feel like you have to fight when the moment comes. The narrative has led you to that point. But similarly, you feel like it is a last resort, not a first option. Which for Kratos, is an evolution beyond his Greek self that even with 2018, I never thought we'd see. But that Greek history informs much of Ragnarok. The prophecy in this game comes from the giant grower and not the Norns, and grower states that all nine realms will be destroyed in Ragnarok. We learn through character conversations that Greece is gone. Kratos' destruction of the Pantheon destroyed his homeland completely. Greece is no more. He has lived the equivalent of Ragnarok once before. He brought it about with his own hands, and a thousand or so years later, he doesn't want to see it happen again. The characters around him, however, want to blindly charge into it like he once did. Seeing him impart knowledge onto others, hearing retellings of the tales we lived in the Greek saga retold as warnings against character actions in the Norse saga is incredibly satisfying. Kratos disarms conflicts with revelations of his past, things like having travelled through time, lost Lysandra and Calliope, his wife and child before Fae and Atreus, had a yoke around his neck at the beginning of Ascension, killing the Sisters of Fate, the conflict and loss of his brother Deimos, even the fact that PlayStation All-Stars Battle Royale is canon to Kratos' story. The way that the past informs the present, the character and the story is superb. Seeing the growth of this character, player and studio in relatively small vocal lines is beautifully nuanced and natural. Having left that long running history mostly in the background in the previous outing, to see it front and center and completely natural in this release should stand as a lesson to other game studios on how to satisfactorily move forward with a story while honoring the past. You see parallels of this characterization in many of the supporting cast. You see a lot of Kratos and Atreus. And you see this god of war doing everything in his power to steer people in a different direction, to avoid his pitfalls and what he wrought in Greece befalling the Nine Realms. It's a beautiful introspective. There's also the fact that this narrative has real fallout, that isn't brought back to point zero for a nice happy ending by the time the story and postgame play out. The characters have to live with their actions and the consequences thereof. This isn't a fairy tale. It is a war to end all wars, to end the gods themselves. The fallout will be profound. And it is the emotional attachment you as the player have to the characters that the narrative has expertly crafted that makes these consequences have weight, have lasting impressions, and have real physical and emotional responses from you as a player. During my time with the game's story, I punched the air in joy let rage fester on behalf of the characters, and wept uncontrollably. It is a testament to Christopher Judge, Sonny Suljic, Deborah Ann Wall, Danielle Buschetti, Richard Schiff, Leia de Leon Hayes, to name but a few of the phenomenal actors, for bringing these amazing characters to life in heartfelt and believable performances. This game is a masterclass in interactive storytelling, interaction, writing, and direction heightened by that immersive single-shot camera design choice. It takes what is already a great game from a design, art and gameplay perspective and elevates it to something special. For me, as a longtime fan of the series who has played every single game, the narrative is everything that a God of War fan could ask for, old or new. Is it better than 2018? That is not a question you should be asking or a comparison you should be making. This is a continuation of that story. This is the closing chapter of that book. You don't read The Voice of Reason 5 in Andrzej Sapowski's The Last Wish Witcher novel and compare it to The Voice of Reason 4. They're part of the same whole, part of the same saga. They complement and elevate one another. They are not comparable to one another being part of the same thing. It would be like comparing your left foot to your right hand and trying to figure out which one is better. Ragnarok is the same. It elevates God of War 2018, offering payoff to huge revelations and small tidbits laid out in that game, making it feel part of that same world. 
It understands, honours and utilises the Greek saga to grow both Kratos' character and the wider narrative. Most importantly though, it understands its player base. Understands player, viewer and story satisfaction. It wraps up the threads that it needs to, closes and completes some others, and leaves some hanging while opening new ones, leaving the door open for more if the right story can be brought to the table. In a world of never-ending, ever-expanding games, to have one that is finite, definitive, cohesive, comprehensive and excellent in its narrative characters and playtime is a satisfying experience that hasn't been offered to me by any other developer for a good couple of years now. Conclusion I love God of War Ragnarok. It is my 2022 game of the year. It is the closest thing to a perfect game that I have ever played. It didn't try to surpass its predecessor, but in doing so, elevated both entries. There are issues with the game, but those issues are either few and far between, or so minimal in the grand scheme of the whole, that they can be overlooked because the positives far outweigh them. An excellent, characterful, engaging story is wrapped up in a solid and stable technical case. The gameplay is Moorish, calling you back even after the story is complete. Quality of life improvements vastly improve the experience, and through accessibility settings, it can be had by anyone in a manner that suits them. It is an experience unlike anything else that has launched this year, including the mighty releases of Elden Ring, Horizon Forbidden West, and Stray. And I think a big part of that is that it is finite. This is an experience that is meant to be had with a strong three-act arc and engaging side content. And once it is done, that is it. You're not waiting for the next DLC or season for the next bit of story or gameplay. It is all here, in the game, at release, for one single price. And it just works, straight out of the box. It is a situation that is missing in the industry as a whole, and to have such a quality example of it land just before the new year is a warning shot across the bow of every other developer, to remember what gamers want and to deliver it. For while live service and ongoing games have their place, they are not the only option, as much as developers have tried to tell us that is the case in the last few years. Thankfully, God of War Ragnarok has just proven them wrong, with the biggest launch in series history, the biggest PlayStation first party launch in history, and even outselling Elden Ring, Pokemon and Call of Duty here in the UK where I live. It only lags behind FIFA in terms of sales for the year of 2022. Not bad for a single player game only available on one platform. And if Kratos' journey through Norse mythology has left you wanting more, make sure to check out my Assassin's Creed Valhalla review here. Otherwise, your viewership is more than enough for me. Thank you for tuning in, and until next time, have yourselves a fantastic day. And take care.